think it's going to start? <laughs> yeah. You comfortable in there? It is. It's yeah, too comfortable actually. Brett Brett says he's definitely willing to climb inside this thing and make a rip, which is good because not everybody wants to do it. <laughs> All right, well, fire it up and uh, let's um, see if it'll go through the gears. That's pretty mean. Yeah. Do you hear it jog? Yeah, I was trying to stay. Yeah. There's no, uh, load, There's on no the load on it. So one of the things that's uh, interesting about this trans is if the transmission is unloaded, it just falls out of gear. So that's one of the things that allows it to be a clutchless transmission. Like with one of these with a manual shifter, you don't need a strain gauge or anything. You just you pull the lever and it goes into the next gear. But whenever the drive line's not loaded, it'll basically fall out of gear. So we have to be careful in how we operate it, both on the dyno and at the course, because you, you won't be able to like pedal this car. If you take your foot off the gas, it's gonna come out of gear. And Craig Liberty gave us some very specific instructions. Basically, once I'm in high gear, I need to turn the trans controller off. That way when the run's finished, I can just let off the gas and it'll just go into neutral. But everything works, which is really exciting. Brett has been hard on this car for a couple of weeks now. Uh, tremendous amount of stuff done. Jim got a tremendous amount of stuff done. And uh, we're gonna head to the dyno and just kind of check the tune up on it. We've, uh, we, we didn't get to run it with the Motec last year because of the weather. So this will be um, just kind of a systems check. So we can see how the boost control responds, see how the fuel curve is, so on and so forth. And then we'll just be more prepared once we get to Bonneville.
well, it didn't really hold it right in first, but then yeah. it pulled it in second. That's why I just shifted it to see what it, it could sounds. Do. Pretty awesome. Yeah, it's sick. I just wanted to keep clicking it. Yeah, it did. <laughs> I was like, all right, all right, all right. Oh, there's more, there's yeah, more. We're not to the finish line yet. Have you ever had as much fun with your thumb before? How do you do something like that? <laughs> not in a room with 15 guys. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right, fair enough, fair enough. Man, what a, what a wild piece. It sounds pretty awesome. Um, it sounds nice, it looks clean. And it was a lot better. Yeah, did you hear it surge going in the third? Yeah. Yeah, it just it needs more engine speed. Because yeah. once. The turbos, it looks like 7,000 RPM, you know, that's when it's starting to happen. Which sounds like forever, but we had 30 pounds of manifold pressure and only 24 pounds of back pressure. So we're in good shape there as far as getting the heat out. So we finished up our dyno work. I was able to get a fuel curve into the MoTeC, get some information on all of the sensors functioning properly. The transmission shifts well. The turbo system works great. We've got good boost control. Uh, the whole thing's ready. It's ready to go. So we're gonna get the panels back on it bring it back to Real Street, and it just needs maybe a wash and a wax before Bonneville Speed Week. So we're back from the hub dyno. Overall, it was a very successful day. We had the opportunity to run the car and kind of get an eye on a lot of the systems, and we probably picked up over a day of screwing around or chasing small problems when we're out on the salt. So very, very fruitful. Anytime you have the opportunity to test the vehicle uh, on a dyno versus just doing it all at the racetrack, you're going to pick up time, which is going to pick up runs, which gets you closer to the end result. So very nice day. Um, overall, the car performed well. We weren't able to get a power number because I don't know the mainline product and I didn't know how to do the configuration right. So it looked like the numbers that we were seeing were about half of what we thought it would make. I'm not really going to sweat that. I have some target numbers. We're going to go out there. We're going to run the car at 30 PSI twin turbo, 64, 66 precision turbos. There's a lot of airflow available. We did encounter surge on the dyno, which was um, really, really a uh, fairly violent experience. For those of you that don't know what surge is, imagine you have turbochargers that present an air mass that is larger than the engine could ingest, and it just kind of stalls out. So if you look at the engine speed line here when we made a gear change at 7,800 RPM, the engine speed line gets all wavy and it is uh, really graphic and um, pretty gross. And it sounds terrible and is terrible to the engine parts. It's about like having, um, it's like wheel hop, but in your turbo system. So do not recommend. We're gonna have to string that engine speed um, shift point up to probably 86, 8700 RPM to avoid the surge. And we'll also lower the boost target because organically, if you look at the log, the system makes um, 30 PSI of boost around um, 6700 RPM. So when you present more boost than it organically makes at a lower engine speed, you can incur a surge. Uh, normally there's like a little bit of fluttering noise. You know, you hear a lot of uh, different vehicles make that surge noise on dynos. But when you get into bigger power, bigger airflow, the surge can get pretty violent. You can break some stuff. So we're gonna raise that engine speed up and we're gonna avoid surge. We do have some good news in our cooling system. You know, we've got this three inch impeller water pump. We were making almost 36 PSI of outlet pressure. So that's that water being pressurized through the engine with high effort. So when you have a water pump that was designed to have a certain engine speed maximum, and now you're over speeding that water pump, you can easily get yourself into cavitation where you're not getting that cooling that you need. And in drag racing on alcohol-based fuels, it's not that big of a deal. The runs over uh, fairly quickly. When you are talking about sustained environments, endurance racing, drifting, land speed racing, uh, road racing, you wanna have as much coolant pressure as possible outside of like the coolant pressure that you discuss when you're talking about a lifted head or blown head gasket. We're talking about coolant pressure with an engine that still has a high level of sealed integrity. It's just the water being forced through the system, dragging that heat with it as the water passes through. If you look at the uh, screen here, we have almost 100 PSI of oil pressure and the oil pressure line is um, increasing with engine speed. 
we may not experience the same when we get out to Bonneville because of the time at our high RPM. Before when we ran the car, we had uh, you know, 8,800 RPM for a long time and the oil pressure started to deviate. And what you have is the oil foaming. So if you go on the daily website, there's a video of the oil in the tank and what's happening to it at high RPM. And that's what we're experiencing now, which we're, we'll have to make some changes to the oiling system. But unfortunately, that's not going to happen until next year because of manufacturing time and just the money that goes into it. So right now we have good oil pressure. We're going to come back to this after Bonneville and discuss what happened to the oil pressure at Bonneville just to help you understand um, and as we understand what's happening to the oiling system and how much of that can be improved because the stronger your oil film that's present separating the metal components, the longer the engine's going to live. Uh, we do have a pretty nice um, pressure ratio. So at, say, if we pick an engine speed 8,000 RPM, we have 29.7 pounds of boost and 23.8 uh, PSI of exhaust back pressure. So we have less pressure present in the exhaust side of the system than the inlet side of the system, which is um, helping us have a fairly efficient engine. Um, again, if you look at that fuel map, it's, it's flat and slightly trending up at high RPM versus if you have an engine that has um, a system that doesn't breathe well, you'll have a, say a peak volumetric efficiency at 6,000 RPM and a much smaller number at 8,000 RPM as that engine efficiency rolls down. Um, if you are looking at engine efficiency, uh, be careful to monitor fuel pressure at the same time because a lot of times systems will be losing fuel pressure in, in increment and you'll have be adding VE thinking that the engine's efficient. No, it's just that your computer's not doing fuel math and your um, fuel system can't keep up. So something to think about if you're, if you're wondering or starting to visualize the airflow through the system which should be your main target is to create efficiency in the system because the more efficient the system is, the less inlet manifold pressure you need to make power and have a sustainable long running engine. One of the things I'd like to have done is test that new uh, drive shaft speed sensor while we were on the dyno. But, you know, this is a team of people that work on this car and uh, Gary, spark plug Gary is the guy that does the wiring. So, I talked to Gary about it. He said, I'd rather you not go into my work. And that is a smart way to do it because then you have one man accountability. If it's a wiring problem, it's Gary's problem. If it's an engine problem, it's Jay's problem. If it's a car problem, it's Brad's problem. And that keeps everybody from stepping on everybody's toes. So we were unable to configure the gear on the dash. So as you look at the video, you'll see that it says in neutral. I know a lot of you guys like to point that out. It's, it's uh, when we get out there and we do the calculated uh, gear ratios and have all that math put into the MoTeC, then that gear will read. But for now, it's just going to say neutral. So hopefully that doesn't bug you too much. But we do have now a drive shaft speed that is going to be a 32 tooth and a front wheel speed that is going to be a 12 tooth. We're going to explain those teeth counts in a later video. That's a whole nother thing to unpack. But basically we have a really good running, really good sounding 2JZ engine. We are uh, just two weeks shy of Bonneville. Um, I'm excited to get out there. We're going to have uh, a 2JZ powered Alfa Romeo, 2JZ powered Streamliner, 2JZ powered Roadster, and the 2JZ powered Datsun. So we're going to have four 2JZ cars running out of one camp. Um, all very excited to have kind of that, that much uh, transitioning from older technology into the 2JZ platform. And a really neat place to share um, durability testing for you guys, uh, you know, because again, the longer your cars stay running, the more you can play with them. And um, if we tear some stuff up, I'll share that with you and hopefully you can avoid the same mistakes. Thanks for watching. Uh, stay tuned for future updates. Again, just a couple weeks shy of the Bonneville Speed Week 2023. Hopefully we can get some pretty big numbers on the board.